Hello everyone. I'm uh, very sorry for this late delay there. Um, I'd just like to start by saying this is my first time in Athens and it is an absolutely beautiful city. It's absolutely stunning. You can probably tell from my accent already that I'm from Scotland. Uh, I'm currently working in Sweden and to be quite honest that means that I had no idea you could get weather like this at this time of the year. <laughs> So I've been through a, a number of large-scale transformations. These are all enterprise uh, transformations, and one of the common things that you tend to find is with the mindsets among managers and leaders. And that's the thinking that if you switch out your team-level process, you can fix your organizational dysfunction. Does that sound familiar for anyone? And unfortunately, it's, it's simply not the case. Um, but it goes even further than that, it's even worse, because leaders and managers have often spent many, many years building up the skills and their career based on things that are no longer true in the digital world that we work in. So it's very difficult for them to look at the organization with new eyes and say, how do we go about transforming the organization to create the environment for teams to be successful? So that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about how can leaders and managers find the opportunity to look at their organization with fresh eyes. We interrupt this program to bring you a special news bulletin. The Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor, Hawaii by air. President Roosevelt has just announced. In 1941, the 7th of December, the Imperial Japanese Navy Air Service attacked the American forces at Pearl Harbor. The attack began just before 8 o'clock in the morning, and over the subsequent seven hours of bombardment, 2,433 American people lost their lives. A further 1,178 were wounded. Now, it's widely believed that the reaction of the American people is one of the key reasons that America, who had stayed out of World War II at that point, ended up getting involved with World War II and joining the Allied forces, which in many ways is very fortunate. But what's a little bit less known is the fact that this is a perfect example of weak signals. Weak signals are tiny fragments of information that are available to anybody, but they're missed because of interpretation. If you look at Pearl Harbor, there, there were a number of different signs that came along in advance of the attack that correctly interpreted, people would have understood that the Japanese were about to attack. So for example, the, the Japanese uh, embassy in America was informed to destroy all ciphers and all machines and paperwork. A few days before, there was a, a Japanese midget submarine that was destroyed at the mouth of Pearl Harbor. And then on the very morning of the attack itself, there was a massive number of incoming aircraft identified, but again, the information was wrongly interpreted. And these same weak signals are around for all of us in our enterprises. And the way that we interpret those weak signals is the difference between catastrophe and success. Is anyone else in the room guilty of walking along the street and texting? I know I did it yesterday. I was walking along the street and unfortunately bumped into more than a few people while I was trying to research information for this talk. But we're not very good at multitasking. And this is what we refer to as inattentional blindness. So 
Unlike weak signals, which is fragments of information that is widely available, but not properly interpreted, an attentional bias or blindness is when the information is there, but it's not being looked at because our attention is focusing on annual budgeting cycles or governance models or taking decisions at different parts of the organization. There's many different um, really interesting studies that have been done around inattentional blindness. Uh, one really good example is with, um, with clinicians, clinical radiologists, and they're reviewing uh, CT scans of the lungs. And within those CT scans, what they're not told is there is a gorilla put within those images that is significantly bigger than the can cancerous nodules that they're looking for. But still, because they're so focused on the job that they are experts at, they don't see this gorilla waving out at them in the image. So again, this is another example of things that are important to us in the enterprise. We need to detect weak signals, we need to interpret those weak signals, and we need to make sure our attention is looking at the correct things. And ultimately, this, this comes down to experience. We have many long-held assumptions. As we said at the beginning, managers and leaders often have built their careers over many, many years in a different time with a different pace of business. And in fact, many of our management practices have been with us for well over 100 years. We go right back to Frederick Winslow Taylor and his production line in the early days with scientific management, where the most important thing for economic efficiency was to break all tasks down into the smallest units and then for the, the managers and leaders to become the architects of efficiency and distribute those tasks in a way where people who were performing them didn't need to actually understand the information. So we come back to the question, how can we help our leaders and managers to understand exactly what information is important, how to interpret it, and then how to pay attention to it as well? So today, the story I'm going to tell you is through the eyes of Anastasia, who has just taken over as a managing director of a new company. Now, she's smart. She knows what she's looking for, but the reality is the company that she's joining is in a very traditional enterprise. His research has been proceeding to develop a line of heavy-duty transmissions that establishes new standards for reliability, durability, and quality. With customer needs as our primary focus, work is proceeding on the crudely conceived idea of an instrument that would not only supply inverse reactive current for use in unilateral phase detractors, but would also be capable of automatically synchronizing cardinal grammeters. Such an instrument is the turbo encabulator. The turbo encabulator, fantastic piece of equipment, entirely fake. This was created many, many years ago as a practical joke. Uh, and it's gained quite some considerable traction over the last few years. However, this is Anastasia's chief scientist telling you about the product that they're all very proud of. So do we all fully understand the product? No. Okay, so one short little bit more information. Now basically, the only new principle involved is that instead of power being generated by the relative motion of conductors and fluxes, it's produced by the modial interaction of magneto-reluctance <laughs> and capacitive directance. Complete nonsense, techno babble. <laughs> However, as you can see, this is a very traditional organization that Anastasia has to find some way of transforming. But she's very well read. So, first of all, she follows Dave Snowden. So, she knows all about the Kinefin framework and she knows all about complexity. She also understands Schuch's model. And of course, she also understands the limitations. Uh, of thinking and traditional management and therefore the importance of finding the marginal voices in the organization. So she find, wants to find a way of crowdsourcing the intelligence that she needs in order to be effective. So I'm not going to go into detail on the Kinefin framework. I believe Dave Snowden has just touched down just now in a plane uh, and he's going to be talking here on complexity tomorrow. Uh, but the key thing to understand here is from Anastasia's perspective, she's looking to evolve an organization. And an organization is, of course, a human system. And any time you're trying to work with a human system, you're working in the domain of complexity. So the key things that we need to think about is how do we create enabling constraints? How do we probe or experiment, sense the results from those things, and then respond? And really, we're looking for emergent practice. Now, 
Go and see Dave's talk tomorrow, but this will come out over the course of uh, this talk just now. Then there's Schuch's model. Now, I really like this because the traditional thinking is that you start by attempting to change the culture, which then in turn affects values and attitudes, which then in turn affects what we do in the organization. The way Schuch reworked, reworked this was to say, actually, if we change what we do, that will have an impact on the culture. So what Anastasia wants to do here is build in the thinking of learning through doing. How do you, re how do you interact with that complex system that's the organization, and how do you make changes that is going to finally evolve the culture, but fundamentally by starting by learning hands-on within the organization? And then finally, the bulk of uh, what this talk's going to be about today is how can we create a product experimentation team that allows us to do those things? This product experimentation team has to be able to get hands-on with the organization and do everything through the lens of building products, so it's very relevant to the organization. And of course, it has to work in the realms of complexity. Now, I'll continue the story from Anastasia's perspective for the next short while. However, where I will bring this on to towards the end is um, Volvo Cars in Sweden, uh, who I'm working with a lot at the moment. They've actually been taking this approach for the last year, and they've had incredible success with their digital transformation. And in fact, we have Victor and Cecily in the crowd today who have been involved with these teams in, in, uh, in many different ways. So it'd be good to talk to them later on. So, Anastasia wants to create this product experimentation team. She's going to start, first of all, by understanding what are the skills that I want to have in that team. No, not roles, skills. Now, what she's then able to do is form this team comprising different types of skills from all these different people. We want to move away from the traditional mindset of people having roles that they go in and they only perform in that way, shape, and form. We want people to interact together and through their interactions to allow the correct behaviors to emerge through time. So what you end up getting is this overall view of the skills within the team that gets you to where you want to be. Now then, Anastasia is going to want to set a goal for the team. Now naturally, they're going to be building digital products, so the goal has to be fundamentally digital. However, we're not going to tell them how to get there or what to do. Instead, what we're going to hear is a short chat from the, the chief support officer within the organization, and he'll tell us a little bit more about the problems that we've got in that space. Since little or nothing is known about the principles involved in magneto reluctance, diagnosing faults can be a problem. Connect a DRV2 to the aft end of the MOXI interrupter using special adapter WUPD2, making sure the osmolality of the phase detractors is not extrapolated. Begin the test by selecting model year, transmission systems, and turbo and cabulator run test. If there are any system faults, they will be displayed in secret code on the DRB2 display. It's a simple head code. Anyone can catch it. A secret code. Fantastic. So the challenge that Anastasia is going to set for the team is how can you improve the experience for customers who have to interact with this physical product? And we want you to do that through digital. So she's not saying go and build this very particular product with these very particular things. She's simply setting the playing field for what she wants to happen and for the team to interact and discover how they're going to, what they're going to create and how they're going to create that. Now, in a very traditional organization, and probably in this organization uh, up until this point, they would dictate exactly the route to create that product. This is what to create, and this is how we want you to create it. These are the structures that you will report to, this is how the finance is going to work, and these are all the people who are going to sign everything off. Does that make sense to everyone? Have we experienced that? Anastasia is going to take a fundamentally different approach here. And this is more like the enabling constraints that you have when you're working within complexity. So we're going to say, these are the areas where you absolutely should not go. After that, everything for you, team, is fair game. You can do anything you want as long as you don't break those enabling constraints. As Dave Snowden talks about with the, the kiddies party, that's a line in the sand that you do not cross. So what would these be for this team? So what we've done at Volvo Cars is we say, every six weeks, you must take that product from opportunity or problem space 
all the way through to being out in the production environment as a released product. You have six weeks to go from nothing to a brand new product that is out working with our customers. In addition to that, every single week over the course of those six weeks, you must get customer feedback on the thing that you're building. You cannot leave a week without having customer feedback. You must be able to deploy to production absolutely every day without fail. And then the final thing, which is often missed as well, is measurement. Everything that you do and everything that you put in a customer's hands, you must have a hypothesis on what you expect is going to happen, and you absolutely must be able to measure the impact that you get from that. So this is a big task. And the stage is going to have to provide the, the product experimentation team with lots of new ideas and new information. So if anybody wants a, a snapshot of some good books to read, I would uh, grab these ones. And it's going to be really important once they start interacting with the rest of the organization. If you've heard Dave Snowden talking about attractors, that's what this basin is here. But why is it called an attractor? Well, these could be social norms within the organization. It could be decisions that have been made. It could be strong personalities within the organization. But the reality is, whatever it is, people gravitate towards that basin. This is the existing organization. And it gets worse than that because, as Mitch Kapoor would say, architecture is politics and politics is architecture. So the organization over many years starts to build all these different structures, whether they're technical or whether they're simply social or political, around the organization to maintain it in the state that it's in. And for the first time, the product experimentation team realized what they really need to do. So they have some major constraints. They have to move really quickly, go with a new product to market in only six weeks. They need customer feedback. They must release daily. They must measure everything that they do. And now they're starting to realize that the constraint there is within the existing organization. Now that's really important because the whole point of this team is that they're going to come up against all of the existing uh, business architectures and processes and behaviors and mindsets that are there. This team are never ever going to be able to change anything if they don't interact with that complex system. So this puts a big challenge on the team and on Anastasia. I'm sorry, I don't know why Anastasia's head is a floating head. This, this came out late last night, so I apologize for that. But the team now need to figure out, how are they going to do this? So Anastasia, as a new leader, is going to give them the air cover that they need in order to experiment. This is a probe sense respond in the Kinefin framework. They're going to probe in order to see what the reaction is to things, and then they'll sense the reaction within the organization. And then Anastasia will respond by either amplifying that or dampening it if it's not beneficial. So the team quite quickly at this point start moving to experimentation. Now, an experiment could be anything. So if you think you need to get a product out to market in six weeks, perhaps your governance board meet only once a month and something needs to be approved by them. Well, that simply isn't going to work. So what experiment are you going to run? Perhaps there's a, a simple conversation that is, are we able to be pre-approved with this thing that we're doing? Or if it's technical, perhaps it's, are we okay to go off platform for this particular one? The key thing here is the use of the word experiment when we're talking about this, because as soon as you phrase something as an experiment, people start to become a bit more relaxed around letting you try different things and seeing what the possible outcomes are. But either way, Anastasia is absolutely going to have to cover the team and let everybody know it's okay that these people are breaking the rules. The other benefit of this, of course, is you now start to get away from the endless debate cycle. So, for example, the, the devil's advocate approach in management that came out many years ago would put somebody into the, the planning phase to, to actually host deliberately the alternative perspective, but it's still a big upfront plan. What the product experimentation team allows you to do here is to try changing something, see what the impact is in building digital products, and then base your decision on that information, on real data. So, Anastasia now, starts to see potentially the emergence of a new attractor. This is dispositionality. When we're looking at an organization, that organization will be likely to move in one way or another. 
So if you set an end goal for something, it will be very difficult to get there. But if you just nudge the organization continually in one direction or another, that can be exceptionally valuable. So Anastasia is starting to see the emergence uh, of a new attractor. I suspect him to amplify that, get some more support around that team. And what you start to see now is gradually the rest of the organization moving into new behaviors. Something starts to become more of a social norm. Now, this isn't what you often see people doing with transformation, where there's a big multi-year plan and we're going to transform. This is probing, sensing, responding on an ongoing basis to nudge and evolve the organization through time. In the end, they're happy. Why are they so happy here? Because once you've created this new attractor and you've started to socialize these new behaviors, ultimately you're able to achieve new things that you weren't able to achieve before. But this, this happens through time. So this is something like the six-week process that the product experimentation team at Volvo Cars would go through. It starts with identifying a business challenge or potentially a customer opportunity. And then you go through this mayhem that's essentially product discovery. What is the thing that we want to build here? And once that starts to become more clear, after six weeks, you get to the point of releasing some kind of business value. But every time that product experimentation team goes through a six-week process, what you start to realize is you identify continually more of these negative organizational structures that get in the way of true agility. So you can start to incrementally work through these over time. So every time they go with a new product to market, not only have they got brand new insights about the customers and about the organization, not only is there a new product that's hopefully bringing revenue, so the team gets the position of being able to fund themselves, but every time you exercise those old organizational behaviors and you nudge the organization towards that really positive behavior. So I've mentioned we've done this for the last year in Volvo Cars. Um, I'll share with you one or two images and uh, one or two examples of types of things that might evolve if you take this approach. So this is, the, this is a pet team here, the product experimentation team. That's Cecily actually at the front uh, of the wall. She's in the back row there. Hi, Cecily. Um, and what they're doing is, when we say around the enabling constraints, we're not mandating anything upon the team other than saying don't cross the line of those enabling constraints. So they're not a scrum team, they're not an XP team. They've just got these enabling constraints and they allow the right behaviors to emerge. They're exceptionally agile and exceptionally lean in the principles that they adopt, but that's at a principle level. It's not at a methodology level. What that allows them to do is start to identify things such as, when do we need experts within the team that simply aren't available? So these might be experts who are split 5% here, 5% here, 5% here, across all these different things in the organization. If anyone's read Phoenix Project, or possibly even from your own personal experience, it's probably quite familiar. But then the product experimentation team could do simple things like prompt and say, would it be possible perhaps to train up somebody on that very specific bit that we need you for? Might be good, might be bad, but it's a conversation. You know, it's a very small experiment. And I say, tell you what, why don't you come here and we see if we can get rid of the other work that you do? There are many, many different questions that you can ask, but the end impact is the expertise that you need within the team, eventually, as long as you have the leadership support and the management support, does get there. Stakeholders. If you're going to take a brand new product to market in only six weeks, there's quite a limited amount of time that you can end in that, you can put into that endless debate cycle. So how can you set up and how can you challenge the existing organizational constructs around stakeholder management, and about requirements, and all these difficult things that can really slow down the organization? Tools and platforms. Sometimes tools and platforms are owned in different departments or by completely different people who certainly don't want to give you access to the platform and allow you to make things because, you, you know, you might damage that thing. It could be terrible. Well, perhaps you, again, bring somebody into that team or perhaps there are different instances of things that you can do, but you have to bust up. You need a team that can bust up against these challenges with the remit to do that and the support from leaders if you're going to be able to exercise those challenges. Technology, simple technology selections. Sometimes the way our architectures, you know, Conway's law, 
uh, bearing out again, I know it's been heard many times today already, but sometimes technology decisions that are taken make it very, very difficult for us to move at pace. If you phrase things as an experimentation for a very few short weeks, that allows you to try new things that otherwise the organization may not have been open to trying. Governance models, you know, can you shortcut governance models and can you have pre-approval on different things? And cross-departmental things can be challenging as well, especially if you come from a, a traditional functional organization, perhaps moving to a more uh, cross-functional product uh, orientation, then you're still going to have different touch points and different dependencies on other departments. Um, so another area that has to be exercised if you're going to be able to reach high performance. So just in summary, what Anastasia has done here uh, and what the, the team at Volvo Cars has done ultimately is understood the Kinefin framework and how, how you need to work within complexity anytime you're doing organizational transformation. They've looked at Shook's model and understood that need to be able to change behavior if you want to change the culture within your organization. You can't just think about things up front and put people in front of screens and teach them things. You have to change the behavior and change how you do. And then created this team of the voices that perhaps sometimes would have been marginalized voices or they would have seen as dissenting voices within the organization and actually use them to a purpose of finding the challenges within the organization and exercising them and finding new ways to do things through this incremental probe, sense, and respond. So my words to you, if you want to try this, get the team up and running and tweet me and let me know how you get on. Thank you. Gary, thank you very much. I think we've got time for some questions or some, some interactions, some, some comments. Anybody want to raise their hand really high so I can see it? It's, there we go, right at the back over there. <laughs> Good exercise. That's okay. Thanks. Hello, quick one. What would be the three things that you would uh, try to do or avoid if you had a brand new software development team being established in a big organization that hasn't had any software development capability so far at this point? Wow, okay, um, big question. And so the, the people who are um, going to be leading these teams or are running this part of the organization, do they have experience with developing software products? In the past, but not within the same organization, in other organizations. Okay. Um, yeah, it's, it's very tricky, um, I, I think, and it's something I've seen in a, a number of different organizations. Quite simply, the, the management and leadership structures that are needed to be put in place to get a team really effective are quite counterintuitive from a, a traditional mindset. Um, so I think some of the things I've touched on here that become really important is telling the team what you want to achieve. I suspect if, if people are joining a, a development team and they've, they've built software before, they probably have a really good idea of what works. Um, and quite often one of the, the biggest challenges for people is when they're having mandated, um, mandated approaches or different uh, constraints that are perhaps more governing constraints than enabling constraints that prevent them from being able to do the things that they do. I would say a large amount of um, my job and a large amount of, of people that I know that, that do a similar job to me is, is getting the team enough space to allow the right behaviors to emerge. Um, and then I think perhaps one other thing I would add on to that is, um, if, if you don't read it already, I would read the, the State of DevOps reports. The 2018 ones just come out recently. Um, but I, I think some of the, the practices and thinking from both an organizational and a, a technical perspective uh, that they talk about in there, um, for example, mean time to recovery. You know, if you can recover within seconds, it doesn't matter too much if something goes wrong. You know, if something, if something goes wrong in a release or uh, a deployment to production and it takes you months to get back up and running properly, then that's a problem. Um, so, reading things like the State of DevOps report that gives a different perspective on, on how you can build high-performance organizations, uh, and especially high-performance digital organizations, is probably a good starting point. Okay, that's great, thanks. Let's see if I can have a question from right down there now. <laughs> Come on, guys, we're not gonna have this opportunity 
immediately. It's going to take a few months for us to arrange this again, yet again. Someone this is your chance. Here. This is your chance. Oh, there we are. Hello. Hi. Um, you have talked on creating the product experimentation team that is in uh, for, let's say, complex business problems. Okay. Um, but maybe this is, uh, I mean, you are taking the, let's say, the opportunity of innovation, of, of um, innovate, uh, or you are the designing, uh, the deciding who are in the company the responsibles of the future of the company, and maybe not creating the other spaces for the rest of the company yep. to, to, to work on this. And so there are people that are the regular staff, maybe boring staff, and the fortunate people that maybe are so disconnected that the innovators couldn't even, in the end, can never mix with the current work, current systems, for example. So... It's a, it's a really good point, and perhaps I've missed something in the explanation. So, although the term experimentation is used to provide the opportunity to go off the beaten track, this team is simply building digital products. And what we've done is we've, we've broken the connection to the legacy world, but they're not doing anything different to the rest of the teams. So this isn't the anti-pattern of an innovation team that gets to do the cool stuff, and then the other people that get to do the really hard work. These people are doing the exact same types of work. They're just given that little bit wider scope so that the organization can test out uh, in small increments how they do new things. Now, there's nothing to say that all of the different teams in the organization couldn't move to this way of working and experimenting as well. The challenge with that in the, the first instance, though, is when you don't have the organization and the, the technology set up in a way to allow this, you could break the organization. But this is a very important point, and I'm glad you brought it up. This isn't a team that gets to do the cool stuff. This is a team who has to butt up against all of the difficulties that all of the teams are experiencing. And one of the key things that Anastasia has to be able to do, and this comes down to the, the amplifier dampened part of uh, responding in that probe sense and respond, is if she discovers something that is having a beneficial effect on that team, then that has to have the opportunity to be amplified across the other uh, teams within the organization as well. But what we've certainly found at, um, at Volvo Cars is the, the sheer presence of this team working in this way has very, very quickly led to people challenging different things and attempting different things and finding some, some really high performance uh, parts of the, the digital organization uh, that otherwise weren't there before. So it's a really important point and I would absolutely never promote uh, having that anti-pattern of some people get to do the cool stuff. No more questions. Then, well, we do have one more there. Let's go in that direction. Hi. Hi. Um, the question is related, is your presentation related with uh, project-based or product-based? I have the impression that it's product-based. So yeah. if we have an organization which is project-based, what will be the differences and the challenges to, to approach this. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that, that's a really good point. And I, I think to become a, a high performing organization, you have to move towards a product orientation because um, you know, I'm sure we're all familiar with the, the stats and figures about 80% of um, the time when you're building things is, is spent in queues and waiting on different things to happen. And when you're in a, a functionally organized um, business, uh, or you're in a business that focuses purely on projects, so it pulls, assembles those people from different areas and then they get up and no longer have they started to get there, then suddenly they get torn back down again. Um, that, that's always going to be challenging. Um, that said, and I'm going completely off piste here because I haven't done this, because the product experimentation team are taking a brand new product to market every six weeks, you can see some parallels potentially with the, with the project world where teams come up and come along and then get spun down after a finite period of time. Um, so perhaps, and I emphasize again, I haven't done this, but perhaps setting up a team like this to work in this way 
might be able to find some of the cha challenges within a, a project-based organization in the same way as it does for a, an organization moving towards product. Um, if you try something, please do let me know. As I say, I, I haven't done that particular thing myself. Um, but I think the way the learnings can come around, uh, that certainly can be consistent. So, yeah. Thank you. I'll give you all oh, a final chance. Yes, we have one more down there. Fantastic. Hi, Gary. Thank you for Hi. the speech. Uh, you mentioned in, uh, just quickly that team, uh, that this pet team should have uh, tools, should have everything in one place for them to work efficiently. So uh, how do you buy in from other participants, let's say the same uh, old team that own the tools and so on and so on, yeah. to enable these guys to succeed? Because all these blockages that are in place may prevent them. They yeah. just won't be able to move on. That's a really good point. And the, um, in any organization, if you, if you have very uh, clearly defined up front exactly what the platforms and tools and everything are going to be, um, that doesn't leave any room whatsoever to evolve how you work or the tools that you work with or the platforms you work with. So by definition, in a very short period of time, you're going to be really quite stuck in the past. Um, so even if you are in a world where um, many of these things are determined up front. There has to at least be some capability for exploring new opportunities and new ways of working. Um, a good example of that perhaps would be um, a tool like Netlify that's, that's come around over the last, uh, last few years. And to some extent, and this is very, very loose, but I, I kind of think about it in some ways as a commoditization of DevOps. You know, because it, it's so simple to get things up and running. And e even from the, the technology perspective now where you've got Lambda and everything hooked into the back, there's so much you can do that simply abstracts away all of those infrastructure concerns. Um, if you're not able to find small ways to experiment with these new things, then you're always going to be spending a fortune on big groups of people who are investing time in manually doing all of that stuff for the organization. So I think for me, this comes down to a little bit the architecture is politics and politics is architecture. Many people in the organization are not going to want to see that change. Um, and I think it is very important for this is we've, we've got a, an incredibly good uh, leadership team at Volvo Cars uh, who are supporting these ways of experimenting with new things to do. Uh, and that's opening up a, a huge range of possibilities. I think the one final thing in there that I mentioned earlier is framing these things as experimentation does help leave people a little bit more open to trying things because if you do something for six weeks and you launch a product and you know it's not working out or you want to change the tech or you want to go back to your traditional governance model or whatever it is, that's okay. You know, it's six weeks. It really didn't cost that much. Um, so yeah, I think that framing of experimentation, but even still making sure there is a way to serendipitously try things out is, is very important. Gary, thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, everyone.